welcome to this episode of Conversations with UX Copenhagen. I'm extremely pleased, not pleased that my dog is barking right now, sorry. Extremely pleased to invite Fidea Sharma, Dr. Fidea Sharma, to the, uh, to, as our guest today. Um, I've had the pleasure of already speaking to him, which is kind of cheating because what I really like to do with these conversations is have my initial talk with potential speakers for the conversation because the, the topics that we go around on these initial talks are always so super interesting and it goes in all directions. It, of course it will this time as well. But uh, so yeah, I had the immense pleasure of meeting you already, um, but I'm so happy that you would join us today. Thank you for that. No, thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and, and nice to see there's, uh, there's other members visiting as well. Yeah, I think we sold about 30 tickets, so there should be coming to or sold, they're free, but you know, there should be some, a few more people joining us. Um, Great. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, please? Sure. No, thank you. So my name is Bidea. I'm a, a healthcare professional or a doctor by background. Uh, more specifically, I work in transplant surgery, which is a fantastic um, space to work in. Very, very rewarding. Um, I thoroughly enjoy my clinical career. But at the same time, I've also had the opportunity to work in digital health. So I've done a PhD in health informatics. And I've also held something known as a Topol Digital Health Fellowship here in the UK. I'm, I'm based in the UK. I should maybe started with that. Um, and um, that's, you know, these opportunities have really allowed me to step outside of the traditional healthcare space and interact with professionals from other disciplines and other industries. And that's been really transformative. And, you know, hopefully we'll get into that during our conversation today. But I think there is a lot that we can learn in healthcare from um, folks in other industries, particularly um, in the design industry, and bring new ways of working, new ways of thinking into healthcare, which is super important to be able to improve services as things change over time, as populations become older, as our understanding of disease develops, as our uh, science um, improves. We need to be able to think of how we translate all these new discovery into usable services that ultimately impact citizens, hopefully at scale. So that's the kind of background from my career perspective. Personally, I'm, I'm originally from the Netherlands. I'm actually from Rotterdam, that's where I grew up, um, but then moved to the United Kingdom for my studies. I'm currently based in Manchester, um, together with my wife, who's a genetics doctor and, uh, and our little two-year-old daughter. Oh, that's so nice. And you've got another baby on the way. Uh, and we've got, uh, yeah, we're expecting uh, a second um, member of the family uh, <laughs> later yeah. next year, yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to have to invite, I mean, I'm going to have to mention that because it might conflict in your being able to speak at UX Copenhagen. So, but That's in right. case, you know, we'll bring you back some other time, just in case. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, that is so interesting. So bringing new voices, you said bringing new voices or new perspectives to healthcare, which is awesome. And that's what we try to do in most fields of UX, as a matter of fact. How is that accepted by like other doctors and how, how is that in the field of healthcare? Is that is that easy? Yeah, I mean, that's a fantastic question. So the short answer is no, um, right. <laughs> as I imagine is, is perhaps true of other specialist industries as well. I think one of the challenges in healthcare is that uh, there are a couple of challenges in healthcare. I'll, I'll start off with thinking about how we traditionally solve problems in healthcare. So, and you know, I will very much reflect on my own experiences as a healthcare professional. I um, have been very guilty of this in terms of when we practice as healthcare professionals, we've got a particular way of solving problems. So when a patient comes to us, we have perhaps a list of problems that could be wrong with them, and we try to narrow down as quickly as possible. We try to converge onto a solution as quickly as possible. And that way of that approach of problem solving works well in clinical medicine when you're trying to look after patients or if there's someone who's unwell in front of you, but it's not the way to solve complex challenges or design new services, particularly in the kind of complex adaptive systems as healthcare is by nature. So we traditionally have got this 
way of thinking or this approach to problem solving, which is not very conducive to complex problem solving. We're not very, I guess, open-minded or we don't always take the time to empathize or spend time observing or really understanding a problem before we embark on on designing a solution or perhaps even implementing new technology services etc and would combine that with uh, i don't know whether this is appropriate to say but i would perhaps combine that with the fact that folks that work in healthcare often are highly educated they are often from a certain perhaps background which puts them into perhaps a more privileged category and, you know, if I try to think of my, even myself, or if I try to think of my consultant colleagues, they are highly trained, you know, they've spent a long time in education or um, practicing their craft. And as a result, there is a overall sense of, I don't know, entitlement or perhaps a sense of, I've trained so much, I'm an expert, I know what's best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that, again, um, feeds into that lack of open-mindedness, lack of humble hum humility when it comes to people coming up with new ideas and saying, well, gosh, you, you're doing this in a certain way. Would you like to explore different ways of doing this? No, no, no. You know, yeah. I'm the expert. Uh, you know, I've, I've trained, I'm a, I've done medicine, I've trained to be a surgeon or whatever. You, mm -hmm. you know, who are you to tell me that I can do, I should do things differently? So there is an element of arrogance or, or lack of humility, I think, amongst the healthcare professional community. And, you know, I think that we, that's something we need to reflect upon and change. And that's certainly something that I try to share with my colleagues as often as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's not easy. No. So how does change get through? How does it happen? <laughs> yeah, I think change happens slowly. It happens if there is an individual or an independent champion for a certain problem or for a, a certain um, patient group, for example. So if I think about, you know, within my own clinical uh, specialty of, of transplantation, um, about 10, 12 years ago uh, within the United Kingdom, um, part of the United Kingdom is, is Northern Ireland, and the rates of living donation in Northern Ireland were the lowest in, in the UK. And um, folks over in Northern Ireland reflected upon that and they tried to come up with new solutions or ideas of how to drive up the awareness amongst the population around the benefits of donating an organ to a person who has kidney failure, for example. And though they came up with some good solutions, the real change or transformation that took place there was that there was one individual kidney doctor who said, no, this needs to change. And they themselves ran you know, organized clinics that they would run on a weekly basis. They organized all the hospitals to refer those patients to this individual doctor, and they took it upon themselves to transform mm -hmm. that service. And they were the real champion and driver behind that. And today, Northern Ireland has the highest rates of living donation in Europe. And no. one of the, uh, which is fantastic. And, you know, this, this person that's done this is, of course, you know, it is, transformative what they've done and, and you know they are absolutely rightly heralded for it mm -hmm. what I will say the slight I guess small print of that is that though that's fantastic it's not a sustainable or scalable way of driving transformation right so if uh, if this person were to retire which of course they will do at some point there is a risk that their legacy is not carried forward because it was an individual person that was driving it rather than a systematic change or a mm -hmm. service change so there is something to be learned from that, but there's also something to be reflected upon that example that undoubtedly we need to have individuals that champion something, but the change they bring should be something that's sustainable, perhaps scalable across geographies, across populations. Mm -hmm. And that sounds really difficult to do as well. Then you need more champions who have the exact <laughs> same principles and ideas and, and thoughts, right? Absolutely. And I think I wonder whether this is where we look towards leadership, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's from a kind of a political space or from a government space or from individual um, organizations that operate across geographies. 
and you know that's who we would hope or expect would be able to look at these champions and say okay well what you're doing is fantastic how can we build and support that idea or concept or solution so that it is scalable so that it is transferable and, and you're absolutely right that is not easy I, you know I, I overheard at the start that um, quite a few of the folks are, are not based in the UK and you know the, the United Kingdom has had a, a difficult political time recently as, as I'm sure you, you may have picked up in the news over in um, Denmark as well but that really impacts on how people are able to transform services or, or bring change into the system because if you've got unstable leadership if you've got um, uncertainty then that really falters people's confidence to be able to drive change. And it also puts things at a standstill, right? So any political decisions are put on halt because then we have to build up the new, yeah, the whole new political system. And yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so difficult. But I suppose that's what we're, we're champions at, right? UXers. <laughs> Helping, helping bridge things. One of the things that you and I talked about last time also was that um, priorities are so mismatched. And that also relates back to what you were saying before is that priorities are mismatched. And you know, how do we bridge that? And why, why is it UXers actually that are, you know, or interaction designers, whatever, why is it in our field that we're so good at bridging these things? Do you know? <laughs> Huge question. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. I think one of the, the the challenge around incentives is that healthcare is a complex domain, right? People often, um, you know, in, in my field around, around digital health, around health IT, will often say, oh, you know, I can use an app to order dinner or, I, you know, my bank seamlessly transfers between accounts or, you know, rest of my life is, is very digitally enabled. Mm -hmm. Why can't that be the case for healthcare? And, um, lots of reasons for that, of course. Um, and I don't think it's a fair comparison to say, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, we just want to, we want healthcare to be like banking is, is a phrase that, you know, I hear sometimes. And, and I think that's an unfair comparison because mm -hmm. healthcare is complex because A, it's about people and people inherently are different, um, you know, across, not just across cultures and geographies of populations, just even at an individual level, right? So people are completely unique and therefore um, their disease burden or their health is also similarly going to be unique. So it's difficult to design services or solutions that scale across populations easily, which is why, you know, there is this thing about um, different places have their own nuances on how they prioritize what part of healthcare is important for them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Having said that, there is something about, I don't know whether it's guardrails or whether there's broader principles around how we design services. And this is exactly where I think what you're describing, Hella, where the, the role of UX comes in is how do we use some of the guiding principles from the design world and bring that into our individual healthcare use cases. And that's really what I, you know, love to love to champion, or you know, love to talk more to certainly my healthcare colleagues about. It's fantastic to have this platform and and, and speak to speak to you today. But really, what uh, the the audience that I'd love to start to convince, and we're making some headways with that, is is our healthcare community, particularly our healthcare leadership, around. We need to have this different approach to thinking, and we need to be really open to say, gosh, we need to bring in some folks that have got this disease expertise into our space and listen to what, what they've got to say so that we can you know, work together with them. And that's something that we have not done enough of. Um, and you know, it's, it's slowly changing and hopefully we're, we're gonna make some headway in the, in the years to come. And I certainly want to try to contribute to that agenda. Yeah, that's excellent. I love that. But um, yeah, it brings me back to also something we talked about last time is that you said, a lot of people are creating healthcare apps, and I actually know quite a few in Denmark as well. Great apps, but they're never used by doctors, so they're never recommended. And that's because there's no academic research. There's no white paper on it. I never thought about that. I never ever thought about that. You know, uh, I was just like, oh, it's great. I know, I know a perfect example of a uh, an app here called Rheuma Buddy, which is excellent mm -hmm. for people with rheumatism. And I know that a lot of, they have a lot of users. 
and it's great, but I never thought, you know, it just never entered my mind that doctors wouldn't think this was anything that was worth recommending, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that's it. You know, you, I think you've highlighted a great challenge there. Again, thinking about how healthcare professionals operate or think or how they approach problems is that the way we make decisions is the phrase used is evidence-based or evidence-driven right so <clears throat> any kind of intervention that we suggest to patients whether it's prescribing a, a pill or whether it's prescribing an operation or a cream or whatever it may be the theory behind that decision must be evidence-based so there is you know a world of academic literature out there and people do studies and trials any kind of drug that comes to market will have gone through numerous trials and regulations and approvals to make sure it's safe effective etc it's compared to other medications and all the rest of it and that rigorous process of evaluation um, does not happen in in the digital therapeutic space so no. that's part of it so, so we don't you know that's not yet part of it it is increasingly being introduced and there are you know, so for example, in the United Kingdom, we've something called got called the DTAC, which is the Digital um, Therapeutics Assessment Criteria, um, which is a, a framework set out by the National Health Service for any kind of new application or any any new tool to be validated. So there are um, frameworks being introduced, which will help build that evidence base. But then the second part of that is we need to then communicate that to the healthcare professionals, or we need to bring that into the space of healthcare professionals. And I think there is still a gap where um, these new ways of treating people are still relatively unknown amongst the healthcare professional community. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a big piece around education and, and awareness. I wrote a short piece for the British Medical Journal about the importance of training. Um, I specifically wrote about doctors because that's my clinical background, but I think this applies to all healthcare professionals we need to train digitally competent clinicians for the future. And, and I think that really starts at, at undergraduate level. That's something that's, you know, not not happened yet. So that's certainly something that I try to advocate for. And I, I teach on the health informatics masters here in Man Manchester. But again, that's only for a select group of people that yeah. got an interest in digital. But really, digital is is part of healthcare. And one of the things that I've kind of been reflective on recently is digital isn't something that healthcare uses or um, is part of healthcare. It is ingrained. I think contemporary healthcare, even more so going forward is by nature a digital enterprise mm -hmm. whether that's you know patients engaging with apps or whatever or the way that i work as a doctor i was never taught in medical school that 70 plus percent of my time is spent behind a computer screen right that's not something that i ever trained or learned about or you know of course that you spend a lot of time speaking to patients and, and learning how to communicate effectively and 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 try to be kind and compassionate and all those things are are critical but then when you start working as a doctor, you realize, gosh, I'd love to be compassionate and caring, but actually I'm just distracted by this computer screen the whole time. <laughs> it's like say, flashing alerts at me. Uh, did you say 70, seven zero? Uh, say it again. Did you say 70% of your time is on the computer? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably say so. Yeah, mm -hmm. easily. <laughs> it, you know, it differs depending on what level of, of healthcare professional you are and of course where you practice. But certainly, you know, in, and you know, this is again, I don't want to digress too much, but for example, in uh, the United States or the Middle East, where they perhaps resource healthcare in a different way, the way they've circumvented this problem around the electronic health record, in other words, the, the tool that doctors, nurses use most commonly to capture the clinical work that they're doing is by employing separate human beings Yep. whose job it is, is to use the computer, right? right? So they're called medical scribes or different terms for the for these, for these this new job that's appeared because mm -hmm. doctors were like, I've never used a computer or, you know, this is not part of my job. Yep. So give that to someone else. I just want to speak to the patient. Sure, that frees up the doctor from that. I'm sure it improves the patient-doctor uh, uh, relationship. But now you're having to employ additional person and additional expense just to run the computer. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Who stood in the corner or whatever. That's crazy. I know they've cut they've cut that here. So, you know, it's all been put on the doctor's shoulders to to do all the digital work as well. Of course. And in the publicly funded healthcare, you know, systems yeah. as in Scandinavia or Northwest Europe and obviously the United Kingdom included, yeah. we can't afford. You know, we can <laughs> we're struggling as it is. Yeah, yeah. 
No, that's crazy. Um, something else I've been thinking about. So the whole theme for UX Copenhagen next year is invisibility. And it's not to be like super mysterious or anything, but it's actually because I read a book by Caroline Criado Perez called Invisible Women. Have you heard of that one? I haven't yet, no, but it sounds like oh, a good recommendation. It's excellent. It's excellent. It's about how, you know, everything is designed um, without taking into consideration that, you know, um, people are not necessarily the average white man. <laughs> that's, that's basically what the book is about. And yeah. I keep recommending it because it's just an excellent read. And what's really cool about it is that she's not like this super feminist, you know, with all these emotions. It's like very factual. It's just like, you mm -hmm. know, she's saying um, crash test dun dummies are based on male, you know, the, the average white yeah. male. And that means that 47% more women are dying in the passenger seat because they haven't been testing for women whose, you know, hips are lower. So the seatbelt actually squashes your intestines instead of, you know, um, taking the force on the hip bones and all this stuff. It's really good. And, but she also mentions that um, the same goes for medicine. So all types of medicine have been tested on, <laughs> on men. And she says that even there are some types of heart medicine that have the exact opposite effect on women. And that, you know, and, um, and so women are actually dying because of this, but you know, it's a, it's a really good read. That's for sure. And she, if you Sounds listen fantastic. to audio, yeah, if she, I'll send out a link to it also, but if you listen to audiobook, she, um, she actually reads it herself. So oh, wow. It's really, yeah. So that's Great. a good thing. Um, do you, do you see any differences? I mean, do you, treat your patients differently or individually? Uh, I think yeah, you raise a fantastic point. Um, this is something that's super important is being talked about now or it's coming into the conversation, which is a great first step. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working on a project around genomics and how do we use <clears throat> genetic tests and to the specific use cases around the fact that we all respond differently to medications based on our genetic makeup. So our genes determine how effective a medication is or how likely we are to suffer with side effects. Uh, and this is collectively known as the term is pharmacogenomics. So the relationship between medicines and our genes. And you're absolutely right. All the data that all this pharmacogenomic knowledge is based on is largely white male North European Yes. Um, ancestry individuals. So does that accurate, accurately reflect, um, you know, if, if based on that data, we design clinical decision support tools or guidance or, you know, this evidence that we talked about before, is that actually representative of the populations that we treat? Of course it's not. So the, the, the fact that people are realizing that this is an issue is a great first step. Yes. And now folks that work in research are increasingly aware of this. And therefore, when they recruit for studies, there are an increasing number of studies that require quotas. So require the sample to be representative of the population that's likely to be served. So people are trying to include people from diverse backgrounds, have a more equal male female split. Um, uh, biological sex split um, and um, they're trying to bring these things into the conversation. Of course, at the same time, you can imagine that to build up this evidence yeah. takes years, right? So we're currently, but today we're making decisions based on you know evidence from the last 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And if we don't make these changes today, then in 20, 30 years time, we'll continue to be making poor quality decisions. The fact that we are trying to square that circle today the benefits of which will only be seen you know mm -hmm. many years from now but we do need to make those changes today yes. um in order to, to achieve that yeah well i mean at least it's starting and although you said before that you know a champion alone isn't enough i do think you know i always refer to greta thunberg because she's just one little mm -hmm. voice you know 16 year old girl who started protesting and look what it's become right yeah so certainly, yeah yeah. So as long as, you know, as long as we're starting to speak about it, then that's good. It's the beginning. <laughs> Absolutely. What made you choose to go into um, the informatics? Um, yeah, sure. So I guess um, it, it probably stemmed from, um, 
I guess, naivety <laughs> and, um, and this frustration that many of my clinical colleagues share around when we're trying to look after patients and we use these IT systems, they're often of poor quality, have very poor usability. And the main frustration that we experienced delivering transplant services, which is which are specialist services, they're typically delivered out of a you know, large academic teaching hospital, but serve a large geographical area, which means that patients come from all over. And, and the way the service is set up um, in, in the UK is that there is a single transplant centre which has at least two or three, if not more, referral centres around, around it. Okay. And whenever a patient was referred to us from a different organisation, we would not receive their data. Right. The data would not travel with the patient, right? Which is, again, something that I think many clinical areas experience or many countries experience. This They, they call it health information exchange or interoperability is like another term that, that folks use to describe that, that friction. So as a result, we had lots of frustrations in, in transplantation because we were dependent on people faxing us a piece of paper, mm -hmm attaching PDFs to emails, sending stuff via post. So, you know, there's all these inefficiencies and risks of transcription errors or risks of data being lost during this process. So that's something that, you know, that, that was the kind of problem area that we started with. And, you know, this is before the time where I was, you know, where I had kind of learned about design. And, uh, you know, me and my prof were sitting around an office and we were like, you know, people talk about the cloud you know there's a cloud my photos in the cloud this is in the cloud why don't we just need to put all our data in the cloud you know straight to the solution you know no questions asked that is the solution no idea what it meant you know no idea what it what the implications were just shove it in the cloud so with that idea um, me and prof augustine um, who's one of my mentors walked over to the university and met with one of the professors of health informatics and we said um gosh you know this is our idea we need to shove it all in the cl cloud let's go let's do it and um, bless him, Prof Ainsworth, who's, who's my um, mentor at the university, he entertained us and he said, okay, well, I, I like, you know, I see where you're going with this and I see the concept, I see the challenge. So this sounds like a great PhD project. Uh, we can definitely work on this. Uh, and that's how I initially was introduced to it. And then um, I slowly but surely, it was quite early to be exposed to um, uh, some designers and um, some folks that do user research quite early on, which are part of the digital health software team at the university. So I was really lucky to be exposed to them earlier, uh, early on in my, my journey, and then went away and, and learned about design and um, did some modules at the university. And as a result, you know, I kind of um, brought that humbleness back and said, gosh, Prof, you know, we had this idea, but I don't think we understand the problem yet. No. <laughs> and then, I, you know, about the three years were spent really just understanding that problem in greater detail. It was fantastic because it was, was eye-opening. We, we did some great methods to try to map out the IT landscape in around in and around Manchester, uh, across the different organisations, what IT systems are used. Spend lots of time, you know, in these different hospitals, just observing folk and um, how they use their computer systems. You know, the best one that I'll, I'll never forget was one of the transplant assessment nurses who assesses patients for transplant uh, eligibility when they're eligible for a transplant, and he had this this paper form that he needs to complete. But instead of printing it, he said, oh, I'll do it as a Word document. So it's digital. Mm -hmm. And um, he had a computer with two screens and then he had his laptop as well. And he would have different parts of the electronic health record open in different places and something else in his laptop. And he'd be like, and he's like, oh, I'm really good at this. This is, you know, I've really cracked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so proud of this workaround that he'd like achieved. And this is what happens a lot, right? People fail to actually see that the solution that they're using is not supporting their workflow, is not meeting the needs and requirements of their workflow. And therefore they find these workarounds and, you know, they might think they are doing something fantastic. Whereas actually in reality, when someone external comes in and thinks, what are you yeah. doing? You've got two computers, three screens, a piece of paper. What is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> That's an example of a non-scalable idea or non-scalable champion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's so funny. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, some examples of what I've been doing as uh, as a UX designer. And I've been in the field for 25 years. And it's just some of the examples are just so funny. 
you know, you just think, I, I, was, I was thinking of this one guy I was testing. We, we created some kind of feature at Nokia and I had a junior tester who came up to me and he said, I got it to crash, I got it to crash. And I was like, okay, show me what you did. He said, okay, if you push this button really hard 30 times in a row, and he went, nim, nim, nim. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I think we could let that one slide. I don't see any users yeah. actually doing that in real, in real life, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but no, no, oh, that's great. Well, um, maybe some uh, somebody in the audience has a question. I see Absolutely. there's only more than three others. We, we're usually quite a few more, and I think 30 people bought tickets, but <laughs> we're signed up for that. Sina, maybe? Hello. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. I don't know if I have a, like a specific question. It's just a really interesting topic and really nice to like speak with health, healthcare professionals that are in digital. Um, that's quite nice. Um, and like I'm checking in on this meeting together with Sophie, who is who is also here because we're doing a master thesis about um, mental health uh, and technology. Um, and that's of course also like, yeah, working with like healthcare professionals and and people that are sick. And I think that's just like a very interesting area to work with people that are like so vulnerable um and their life is on the edge like with uh, these uh, kidney people but also like if you're mentally sick that's like yeah it's just a really interesting area to work with and so important that like these uh, digital therapeutics uh like this area is just so important because it can save lives and yeah mm -hmm. it's so important no absolutely i, I think the mental health space is a, is a really really good place for digital health interventions because uh, well, for many reasons. I think, firstly, the the patient demographic is, is usually usually of a younger age group, so it's more likely to be um, digitally literate. So you've already got you've already perhaps overcome a hurdle that, for example, we have in transplantation, where most of our patients are 50 plus. So as a result, the likelihood of engaging them with a digital therapeutic is more difficult. Um, and it, together with that, you know, I think as you've already highlighted, I'm sure you'll explore as part of your dissertation patients with um, with mental health illness may not always be compliant with their treatment or they might not always visit their healthcare practitioner uh, appropriately and therefore being able to um, support them remotely or asynchronously so it, in between um, the times that they're supposed to come for their visit is really really powerful so I think you know it's a fantastic space there's folks doing you know really really cool stuff in that space actually in Manchester there's quite a lot of research around um, mental health and uh, the use of digital tools, um, particularly for for younger um, individuals, so child and uh, child and adolescent mental health services. So yeah, if you've got um, any further questions or ideas or whatever, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to point you in the direction of any references or any colleagues. Thank you. That's great, Stina. Do you know um, Bex? Uh, what's her last name? Bex and Johnny. They were they've spoken at your Copenhagen also uh they do the tech for good podcast actually not by name i'm not so good at names um, right. uh, I, I don't know why i can't remember their last name right now but anyway i'll introduce you to them because they are they work for a company you might know it yeah it's um snook not a name i've heard of tech for good tech for good um but yeah I've not heard for, about Snook yet. Snook, it's also something about tech for good. And I think it's about mental health. I'm not sure, but Stina, let me introduce you to those two for sure. That would be great. great people. Oh, so you've heard of tech for good. Have you heard the podcast? Yeah. yeah. I haven't listened. I think I've seen it go past or I follow them on some kind of socials, yeah. but I haven't had a chance to listen. They do meetups. You should go meet them. They are excellent people. Really a group of really okay, cool. Yeah. They've been they've been at UX Copenhagen, I think, four or five times, you know, back in the day when we used to be able to do live conferences. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you'll meet them there sometime. But yeah, they do a lot of good. Um, yeah, anything else? Does anybody else have any questions? Or oh, there's a hand up. Sophie's got a yeah. Great. Oh, I have to unmute. Perfect. Um, my name is Sophie, and I'm also in group with uh, Stina, as you just mentioned. Um, I was just very um, interested of what you said about 
the digital apps that are um, very well suited for the patients, but since the doctors don't know about it, they're not uh, supporting the apps. Um, I'm also a midwife and a, um, educated midwife and now going into tech. Mm -hmm. And we have like this very positive experience about this app in uh, Aarhus, which are developed from Aarhus um, midwifery um, consultation. And actually because it's developed with midwives, it's uh, recommended by midwives for, at the consultations. And it's very popular with the pregnant and the, uh, and the midwives as well. It's really helping. But I could imagine that if I was sitting at a consultation with a pregnant woman and they were recommending an app and I would be like, I don't know that app. Uh, there, it's not um, accordingly my recommendations. Then I would be like, maybe just ask me instead of ask and use the app. That would, that would be what I would say to my patients. Yep. Um, but I actually have one question, uh, Vidisha. I don't, I don't know if it's any of your thoughts, but it's just been what I have been thinking about since um, I'm a medical professional who went into technol technologically. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this workspace that we as a staff work uh, around with all these technical devices, all time, always beeping and illustrating visual like lightning red, even though it's not you to pay attention, but it could be one of your coworkers. Do you have any thoughts about all of these technical devices for you as a medical staff to work um, under? Is any positive or negative effects, anything yet that you have been thinking about now since you went into this technical area? Yeah. Really good, really good point. I like the first point you raised as well. So thanks for sharing your your background. Um, I think when it comes to medical devices, there is a huge kind of variability. There's stuff that's designed really well, where people have really thought about how the device is going to be used, or how the warnings should be, or sound, or how they should be communicated. So there is stuff that's been done really well. Um, and I think this really goes back to the first theme that you picked up, which is kind of around co-design and how do you involve the end users during the design of this, these devices or apps or solutions, or whatever it may be. And I think that that's something that we've historically not done well or not done enough of. So certainly in, you know, in my experience, when we're, you know, uh, intensive care is a perfect example. When you go to the intensive care unit, which, you know, I, I'll often do, um, you know, after a after an operation or whatever, um, then there is, you know, a billion things going on and a hundred screens and we don't design for simplicity or we don't design for user experience from a healthcare professional perspective. And because there are competing interests, right? And you, you picked up very early on about people have different incentives or people have different priorities and a big priority in healthcare is this word safety. Right. So people want to make sure that something is safe and they will do extra layers of warnings or pop ups or whatever to ensure that safety element. <clears throat> but what that sometimes does is that it kind of tips the balance in a, in a different in a different direction when something is overly alerting or overly mm -hmm. popping up, then folk are just like ignore, ignore, <laughs> click away, go away. Oh, it's beeping again. It always beeps. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, there is something around, um, I guess, finding a balance maybe between trying to make systems and solutions and devices that are safe, but also that um, that are usable. And I think that's a challenge that we've not you know, mastered as yet. Um, and it's difficult, you know, especially when there's lots of things going on, you know, if a patient is attached to lots of, um, you know, lots of drips or blood pressure and you know, lots, all kinds of things, it's difficult to do that. It'd be great to have some designers walk through an intensive care unit. I think that would be a fantastic, you know, place for shared, you know, ideation and discussion. Um, and I'm sure there would be some great ideas that come out of that. Um, yeah, so, so that, that would be a great place to start. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I would be, I would love to help. So if you need help with that, Fidia, if you have any entryway, then please let me know. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to join you. That'd of be, course. Yeah. Did that answer your question, Sophie? 
yes um yes it is yeah that's great that's so great that you're a midwife that's um it's a critical job here in, in Denmark and there aren't very many right now yeah yeah it's um it's a very um unstable work environment at the moment yeah yeah, yeah. 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 that's difficult what um, is the um or could you send me a link to the uh, midwife app that you were talking about I can send yes, that definitely. that's great thank you so that so does it have a white paper though does, has it been researched academically yeah um yeah yes and no it's oh. only been researched through uh, like the um, the pregnant women's it has not been researched through how the partners of the pregnant women are feeling um so actually this uh, application has been replaced mm -hmm. um no no the the application has replaced a lot of uh, physical pamphlets yes. which uh, earlier on were given uh, at the consultations to the partner and the pregnant women so it was like a shared uh, responsibility to actually gain some knowledge about the pregnancy and now the application is actually um only for the women because of the gpr uh, rules gpr right. rules uh, so there has not been like research of how the pregnancy and family um, development with the partners um, has been influenced. Um, so, but there is an academic paper about how the pregnant women are feeling about the application, and that's good. And there's also been like a research about how the midwives are feeling, um, especially because this application is also replacing a lot of uh, other applications which we do not know of. So we have it more by hand. We know what the pregnant women are reading about because it's our application instead of mm -hmm. all kind of random applications which can say that their child look like a melon or something and they could be upset or feel if yeah so um, it's a good application in my opinion as well but yeah. maybe some partners will think that they are not involved in the same way yeah right yeah it feels like there's a gap to design an app for dads or or partners rather not dads but but partners of pregnant women yeah. um that also give them access at least to the pamphlets of the information even if it doesn't provide any yes. individual um personal details so that there's maybe a place there definitely Stine, who's also uh, participating again and i we last year we also did like a small workshop review of four uh, upcoming dads in aarhus just to try to figure out how do they feel about all of the information now is going directly to the pregnant women. And they all felt uh, that it was out of their hands. And yeah. to actually gain some knowledge about the pregnancy, they had to go through their partner, the pregnant partner, and they did not like that. But the, the partners did have the opportunity to go to our, to go to Aarhus website to gain the same knowledge, but they did not feel that it was the same since they had their own application, the, the pregnant women, yeah. So it was very interesting to work with these uh, medical devices that we recommend from the public, yeah. Is your information also digital, Fidia? Uh, yeah, it is largely um, yeah. for during pregnancy. So yeah, there's a similarly at the app. And in all fairness, there is also a app for partners here um which um which is which is also good um and, and there is uh, similarly like like you described um Sophie they're recommended at um by the midwives at the hospital um so yeah so I think there's definitely something to be said around that um shared design or co-design um experience for healthcare professionals to be able to more readily recommend things um if there is and, and this is the challenge, right? When the, mo the most healthcare apps or solutions are come out of the tech space, right? So there's folk who maybe have the best intentions, but they design solutions, you know, be it apps, devices, whatever, and try to bring them to the healthcare space and say, hey, we've come to solve this problem of yours. And the kind of joke that we make is like, you know, these companies just trying to sell us products for problems that we don't even have yeah. or whatever um whereas if you have solutions or apps that are designed or that are clinically led in other words 
part of the design team includes healthcare professionals, you're far more likely to design something that achieves intended benefits and has an impact on patient care and outcomes. So I think there's something really important, you know, whenever, because the, the, other, the other joke that I make these days with my kind of my friends is that if you go on LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever, everyone's a founder nowadays, like everyone's like founding something and everyone's like, oh yeah, I founded this, I co-founded that. And I'm all often like, what problem are you actually solving? Or how do you really understand this problem before you've embarked on trying to sell this product? And often, you know, I'm disappointed that the problem is not really fully understood. Ooh, I'll take that personally. <laughs> That's a good question. I should ask myself that. What am I trying to solve with the conferences, for example? I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to make people see how valuable user experience is, but that's a tough one. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big question though. It's a big, uh, or a big answer or however you want to put it. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any, anybody else want to say something? I just had one reflection. I think it was very interesting. You said this, um, let me remember like any app that they have to recommend has to be like research and all of this and I, it's just a like a huge gap on the way that like digital we want to do fast we want to fail fast we want to put something out there we want to get feedback quickly all of these things and then the ho hospital and medical like that moving so slow and safe and all of these things and of course that's good but it's just like i could really like I see the cl clash here, right? That it's not, we cannot like in, in our project that we are gonna start, we cannot like, how can we test on people's mental issue? Like, how can we do that in a ethical, correct way? How can we figure out if it like, it, it's better for people or is it getting worse? Cause like, if I have an app that gonna like make people work out a bit more then if it works, it's nice. If it doesn't, then it's like sad, but it doesn't like, do anything so that's just like a really interesting like yeah way of thinking i haven't thought it like so clear before now because of course there is some issues um, there absolutely and thanks for sharing that you know you, you've literally spoken the exact words that i've said in the past which is that there is a a mismatch between how we think the medical or academic world and how we think in the tech world right mm -hmm. and i think that there in order to to align that mismatch, there needs to be compromise on both sides, right? So I think for sure, I think in the medical world and in the healthcare world, we need to become more open to new forms of evidence. You know, I said the things need to be evidence-based, but traditionally that's been something that we call a randomized control trial, which is like a very big experiment or a, you know, a posh way of doing research. And that's always been like, you know, if it's not a randomized control trial, it's not the best level of evidence. So I think we need to change that mindset. And especially when it comes to digital therapeutics or digital tools in healthcare. And then at the same time, I think um, in the tech world, there needs to be a recognition of what are the priorities in the healthcare world, which as we've already talked about, a lot of that revolves around, is this safe, is this ethical? Um, and then some of the newer kind of things that we've talked about um, around, you know, is it inclusive? Is it not um, unfair towards certain populations or is it not excluding certain groups? Is it um, achieving kind of intended benefits? So I think there is a, a balance on both sides to kind of meet in the middle. Um, but for sure, I think on the side of healthcare, we need to be a lot more open-minded to say, you know, there's an app, maybe there wasn't, maybe they didn't compare the app to something else, but they did, you know, test 50 users and, they did that you know in an agile way and they built the app based on iterative feedback and therefore they've now got a product that or now they've got a solution that's been thoroughly tested that's been shown to benefit let's test it at a bigger scale or let's implement it in one practice and if it works let's transfer it etc so there's for sure something that we need to change on our side in terms of mindset as to what we accept is um, valid evidence because yeah, I also remember um, talking with a friend who visited a company that where they were doing like 
an, a placebo app or they wanted to like because they have to say like what happens if it's like we do something but it's not this product but like can we say that this exact product is doing exactly what we want it to be compared to anything else and my mind is just like exploding like how do you do, how do you make a placebo app like that's just so interesting to see like how can we in tech develop new ways of uh, validating or it yeah um yeah validating our apps that's yeah. just very interesting yeah super interesting i'd love to learn more about that it's not something that i've explored previously um the the, the traditional thing that people do when it comes to like comparing is that they'll give one group an app and the other group the traditional model of care so that's maybe seeing a doctor in person or a nurse in person or whatever it may be and doing those two comparisons and that's mm. really difficult because they are just so distinctly different experiences okay. right yeah, so yeah. it's it's not really comparing apples with apples or whatever that phrase is um so so yeah so there are for sure you know new and creative ways that we need to kind of come up with to try to validate mm. um these solutions i don't know what the answer is but a placebo mm. app sounds really interesting yeah. yeah definitely i don't know the answer either it's just really interesting uh, thought yeah yeah and i guess one of the um yeah questions or one of the thoughts that i have is maybe interesting and so if you obviously you work in healthcare so it'd be maybe interesting to hear your experience one of the challenges that, that we have that I've already described is around this um, access to healthcare information across kind of organizations or organi across health settings or care settings. And I feel like I wonder whether that's one of the um, underpinning or foundational challenges when it comes to digital health. So, you know, I know we've talked about apps and about new innovations and new ways of, kind of solving problems, but I wonder whether as we go forward, the foundation of that is, is around the data. So if someone has got an app, for example, and they are measuring their blood pressure at home, then how does that data transfer to say the hospital system and become part of the hospital data? And that's something that I don't, again, I don't think we've done very well in the past. So there are lots of, you know, you've got people might have a Fitbit or an Apple watch that's measuring your heart rate or whatever, but it is storing that data, you know, in the, on your Apple cloud or whatever. It's not really transferring that to your hospital health record. So I guess one of the things that I often think about is as we try to use more tech um, and wearables or apps where people might put in their symptoms or how they're feeling or something like that, how do we, transfer that information into hospital records is that something that's happening in Denmark quite readily or not yet there's been a huge uh, project I remember working on it in 10 years ago 2013 um, where it was about uh, a coalition of all of the patients data uh, across hospitals in Denmark and I mean Denmark is tiny it's like five and a half million people right so you would think that that would be something easy to do, but I remember my son broke his his wrist over in on one of the islands, uh, about three hours away from here, from Copenhagen, and came to Copenhagen. And they called. They came, he came to home to Copenhagen, and then they called from the hospital and said that he had a cast reset because it was crooked or whatever. And I took him to the local hospital, and they're like. We can't even see that your hand is broken. <laughs> He's like, oh, I've got my cast on, you know, but you know, and this is probably seven years ago. So, but it's, it's rolling now. It's out now. Right. Sophie, the uh, patient, what's it's, it called? It's, it's not yet, but they are talking about making it uh, the same uh, system. So yeah. right now, if there is a pregnant woman uh, in, um, in Ranas and belonging to Ranas, and she goes to either Copenhagen or actually only just to north of Jutland. Uh, we would have no records of her or her blood type. So if she gave birth there, we would have to take a lot of blood samples to check her, you know, um, blood type and stuff and yeah. have to uh, her to uh, get a lot of information from her before the birth because we cannot see anything. Yeah. But they're wow. working on it. They're trying to make it all uh, the same. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's interesting because I think that's kind of a foundational challenge um, that that we need to try to solve. Because I think a lot of the 
and everything else kind of builds on top of that once you try to and i don't i don't know whether we will solve it um because i think people have been trying to solve this problem for a long time and they haven't really quite succeeded yet uh, no I, I am positive you know we will solve it but um i feel like once we get to that stage that's when you can really that's when i think you'll really start to see the benefits of of digital health impacting patients at scale so i think one of the kind of ideas that um uh, kind of the emerging thought leadership talks about is this idea um of separating data from application so maybe that's a phrase that, that you've heard before which is currently the way we buy it solutions in healthcare are often kind of what's called enterprise solutions or it's a, a full um, stack of the database the logic and the user interface i think what people are talking about if we want to get to what you've described sophie that you're a, a pregnant mother and you go to different hospitals and your data is available to say okay we, we, we're not going to buy health IT solutions anymore. We're going to buy health IT databases. And then someone like you, Sophie, with your you know, colleagues and network, you might say, well, I've got, you know, I'm a midwife. I've got great experience of um, um, treating women in pregnancy. This is what a um, electronic health record for managing pregnant women should look like. And you then have an opportunity to design user interfaces with end users and people use the term uh, citizen developer i don't know if that's a phrase you've, you've heard before but people talk about this phrase or the one that i'm now coining is clinician developer and you can use stuff like low code tools and no code tools or whatever to start to build user interfaces in an agile way because you're not having to worry about the data part of your your health it solution so you know if i was to kind of think about how could the health IT landscape look different in 10 years time? I think if we try to continue to kind of connect all these old school systems, I don't think we're going to really have that transformation in digital health. However, if we start to think about, okay, so the data is the fundamental part. How can we organize that in a way and then allow people to develop applications through you know, open APIs and, and surface that data in different ways. So we, for example, in, in Mantra, we've just installed a, a new, really expensive electronic health record by an American company called Epic, which is also um, provides software in, in Denmark. And it was a very, very interesting paper from colleagues in Denmark that I was reading last week about their experience with that, which I'm happy to share. Um, and that really just highlights how, you know, Epic is a software company that's 40 years old, their UI is 10 plus years old, you know, it's a terrible, terrible user experience, but it's really expensive and people are still buying it yeah. because we just don't know a different way of working. And, you know, yeah, colleagues in Denmark and Finland in this paper describe a terrible experience with that. Uh, and I think the, the, that fundamental change in approach we think about the data and then we think about the application separately i wonder whether that's the you know the the thing that's going to really transform digital health sorry if that was a bit random and technical sorry no that sounds really smart though. also because you know now that first we've started developing that big product that would you know um encompass all data and then gdpr happened and so you're like, you know, back to square one, right? So if we could, if we could, um, yeah, design the apps without thinking about data somehow, that's a really smart way of thinking. Yeah. It's all about turning it upside down, isn't it? And seeing different yeah. perspectives all the time. Yeah. And there are folks that are talking about this increasingly, and they're talking about platforms and healthcare as, a pro, as, a, as opposed to kind of enterprise solutions. Because ultimately, yeah. what I think people need to realize is that as citizens, we receive care in different places at different times in different settings, right? And we would expect our data to travel with us when we go, right? So like you were saying, if your son is, you know, if you're on holiday somewhere and you have a medical emergency, you expect your information to be there, at least your blood type or your allergies, you know, some of these foundational important bits to be available and that you know that's not the case 
and I, right. I cannot really see that changing unless we uh, unless we approach this problem in a different way. Yeah. It has been fantastic speaking with you, Fidea. Thank you so much. I think that was a good, good way of rounding off. <laughs> And, you know, fingers crossed, I hope everything is well with your family. And, um, you know, let's see how we can get you to Copenhagen in 23. And if not, then definitely in 24. No, that's fantastic. No, thank you for having me. And really nice talking to, to all of you. I really enjoyed hearing your perspectives. Thank you. You too. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining everybody. And um, hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Both. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> see you soon. Bye-bye. It's just a cover what we had was strong Find another Find another one It's just a feeling It's just a feeling of the summer sun It's just color And now it's gone we would love, we would dance, we would kiss, we would feel forever young for the moment We were young, we were lost, we would save that moment for the few Sunset changed before